Blessed be the kingdom of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. And unto ages and ages. Amen. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to St. Peter. As you know, our mission here is to develop fully devoted followers of Jesus. Welcome to our <clears throat> Vespers evening prayer service. Here tonight is Wednesday in the fourth week of Lent. We're in the second half of Lent now, so Easter's almost here. Let's see, I hope everybody enjoyed their dinner beforehand at 6, and of course we have one more of these services next week, dinner again at 6, we'll be in here at 7, and then after that, the following week begins all of our Holy Week festivities, which are all posted on our website. So let us stand and begin. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light when the darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Speaking. 
Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. 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 Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, in your great compassion blot out my offenses. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak, and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me, and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin, and blot out my iniquities. Create a clean heart in me, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away. And take not the Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness, O God of my salvation. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Be favorable and gracious to Zion, and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with the appointed sacrifices, with burnt offerings and oblations. Then shall they offer young bullocks upon your altar. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
A reading from Genesis chapter 50. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, Your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of, your, of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept and fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were also born on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So Joseph made the Israelites swear, saying, When God comes to you, you shall carry up my bones from here. And Joseph died, being 110 years old. He was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For Dan, our bishop in Christ, for all pastors in Christ, for all the servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of Mary, the mother of our Lord, Saint Peter, and all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God, forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Lord, Father, Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be, be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.
while you have been working through the Ten Commandments each week, thinking through the Ten Commandments, and while you have supposed to have been remembering them in order, right? They haven't changed in 3,500 years. I've been thinking through and working through what makes them so difficult for us to hear today. I know this preaching series has been tough. It's not how we usually do things. Yet what makes it tough isn't the large catechism quotations or that we feel challenged and guilty, even held accountable for something we forgot about back at age 13. As I said, the Ten Commandments have been around 3,500 years. They're still not going away. See, if the difficulty was merely our poor efforts, then it's a simple fix. We just try harder until we get it right. But that's not where the problem lies. You and I both affirm the reality of the Ten Commandments and their inclusion in our biblical, apostolic, holy, Lutheran teachings and doctrines. We even take for granted most of what they tell us. We even know better for most of the behavior they indict. The problem is that deep down in our heart of hearts, deep in the back of our minds, we simply think they're optional. They're like accessories we choose to dress up our lives with, right alongside those Browning Buck logos, those Magellan fishing shirts, and our Hey Dude shoes, or our favorite streaming shows and social media influencers and other little bits of pop culture. Although we may be superstitious about the Ten Commandments, we cannot conceive of a world in which they are ever present to judge and to condemn all people in all aspects of life and to guide and encourage the same people in godly behavior. We just kind of wink at them and say, I know, but. As in, I know, but who really believes that? Or still, I know, but it doesn't matter. This is really the point on why this is hard for us. It's not our fond or maybe not so fond memories of Sunday school or confirmation or catechism. It's not our embarrassment at not being able to keep a list of 10 items, right? Just like a phone number. Phone number is 10 digits. You can memorize a phone number. You can memorize 10 commandments, right? So it's not our embarrassment there. It's not even the confrontation of our guilt for having broken them. We simply think in our modern contemporary worldview, no matter how much we agree with them, that they're essentially optional like all of our other free consumer choices. They're just another thing that we choose to consume. Well, as always, it's time to name them all. Click the next slide, please. Judy's off the hook. She found me downstairs before dinner and already got her gold star. And honestly, learning them is easier than cheating, trying to cheat each week and come up with a new way to cheat, right? And it's better than that silly feeling each week that you don't know them still. Just learn them. They're real easy. So let's hear them in order and see if we can get them right on the first try this week. All right. What's number one? God or God? All right. The second grader's whipping you guys. All right. What's next? Well, the third grader takes it. Now what? All right. All right. Elementary kids. Hey, hey, hey. You let the rest of them catch up, right? All right. I know. Miss Rebecca does a great job teaching that to you guys, but you let the grown ups catch up. All right, so where are we at? That's three. What's number four? Father and mother. All right. Then number five? Do not kill or murder, right? Then number six? No adultery, still, right? It's still there. What's number seven? Don't steal, right? This section seems to get it. You guys in the 
back corner over there. Let's try and see if you guys can get number eight in that back corner. It's not a commandment. Try again. No. Number eight, false witness. Don't bear false witness. Then number nine, covet. Don't covet. Don't covet what? Neighbor's house. And then don't covet your neighbor's spouse. All right. Very good. Very good. So tonight, we're working on number seven and number eight. So, from the, from the small catechism, right? Small catechism. Here we go. You shall not steal. We should fear and love God that we may not take our neighbor's money or property nor get them by false wear or dealing, but help him to improve and protect his property and business. Right, that his means are preserved and his condition is improved. Number eight. You shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. We should fear and love God that we may not deceitfully belie, betray, slander, or defame our neighbor, but defend him, think and speak well of him, and put the best construction on everything. Now, belie here means to give a false impression of another person's character or morals or performance, all right? And both of these, while uh, very much New Testament teachings and interpretations, are firmly rooted in the Old Testament notion of love your neighbor as yourself. So the Torah teaches that if you see your neighbor's livestock loose, it's up to you to help him get it back. The Torah also requires any statement about one's neighbor to be verifiable by two or three other witnesses. Right? So, for instance, you don't say that someone's bookkeeping is untrustworthy or someone's bookkeeping is trustworthy. Excuse me. You don't say, well, you know, so-and-so's bookkeeping is pretty trustworthy because it's nice of you to say it. Well, you know darn well the books are not. We'll come back to that. But I was speaking to someone, this was several months back, and about how to answer some questions about the employment of a former manager or executive at a small firm. See, that person had uh, resigned from the firm. The person under question had resigned from the firm to accept another position somewhere else and then was now interviewing again several years later, as you do. And it was a, a delicate thing to discuss both legally and morally, right? You didn't want to say too much, but you also didn't want to say not enough. So I simply told the person who asked me, tell the truth, right? You were there for the situation when that person worked there. Tell the truth. But do not defame or disgrace or accuse or anything else of that former employee. See, the Eighth Commandment's a lot more than not saying things that are untrue or only saying things that seem nice to you, bless your heart, hashtag TBH, and all that kind of stuff. So hear what Martin Luther says in the large catechism about stealing and theft. To steal is not only to empty our neighbor's bank account and wallet, but to be grasping in the market, in all stores, booths, restaurants, workshops, and in short, wherever there is trading or taking and giving of money for merchandise or labor. When an employee does not serve faithfully and does damage or allows it to be done when it could be prevented or otherwise ruins and neglects the goods entrusted to him from indolence, idleness, or malice, to the spite and the vexation of the manager and supervisor. And in whatever way this can be done purposefully, right? Not, not by true accident. You can in a year abscond tens of thousands of dollars. Which if another one, another person, someone else had taken secretly or carried away, he would be prosecuted. But here you, while conscious of such a great theft may even be defiant and become insolent, and no one dare call you a thief. Luther continues, 
We have to tell this to people. To not let them go on in their wantonness and security, but always to place before their eyes the wrath of God and inculcate the same. So theft is not merely taking. It's also cheating, defrauding, wasting, and so forth. Luther goes on to say, And on the other hand, it is commanded that we advance and improve our neighbor's possessions, and in case he suffers want, that we help, communicate, and lend to both friends and foes. Because if we refuse our poorest neighbors, it will reach him who takes care of the poor sorrowful hearts and who will not allow them to go unavenged. Whoever keeps this commandment, Luther says, are favored and crowned with excellent blessings such that we are to be richly compensated from God for all that we do for our neighbor's good and from friendship. I like that. God will make sure that I always have enough to help my neighbor in need, great or small need, to keep and improve what's his. Now, here's the Eighth Commandment. And don't think for a second I'm pointing fingers at anyone except myself. God wishes the reputation, good name, and upright character of our neighbor to, not be, to be taken away or diminished as little as his money and possessions. Now, your character in God's eyes is worth as much as your possessions. And that everyone may stand in his integrity before wife, children, workers, and neighbors. It's nice and clear. After speaking in, to sort of obvious civil and legal senses, all right, Luther then continues. But here belongs particularly the detestable, shameful vice of speaking behind a person's back and slandering to which the devil spurs on and of which there would be much to be said. For it is a common evil plague that everyone prepare, prefers hearing evil to hearing good of his neighbor. And although we ourselves are so bad that we cannot suffer that anyone should say anything bad about us, but everyone would much rather hear all that the world should speak of him in terms of gold. Right? That's what we would want for ourselves. Yet we cannot bear that the best is spoken about others. The issue here isn't if the information being spoken of is true or false. Both will out themselves. Right, it's not whether or not it's true or false that the Eighth Commandment is concerned with primarily. Luther writes, Therefore, to avoid this vice, we should note that no one is allowed to publicly judge and reprove his neighbor, although he may see him sin, unless he have a command to judge and reprove. In other words, false witness, then, is everything which cannot be properly proved and adjudicated. So here's the rule of thumb. Ask yourself, is the person I'm telling this allegedly true thing, the person I'm speaking to, is this someone who can rightly, morally, legally, publicly, etc., do something about the alleged wrong? If not, I shouldn't tell them. I should take it up with the other person I'm complaining about one-on-one. -on -one. Just as we hear about in Matthew chapter 18, just as we talk about in our first steps class. And I may not like the outcome. That's okay. Now, with Dave Ramsey, right, we do the Dave Ramsey stuff around here. If you violate this policy twice, you get fired. Consequently, Ramsey Solutions, right, it's home of financial peace, the radio show, the live events, all of it, is Nashville's top place to work. So, for instance, say so-and-so is late to work again. As always, you grumble. And you grumble to a coworker about, I wish somebody would do something about that. Strike one, right? Or you bring it up with your employer, your, your supervisor. Hey, how come so-and-so is always late to work? I don't like it. It's not fair. What about the rest of us? 
And the supervisor, who can do something about the situation, says, I'll take care of it. The end. You have nothing left to say. Besides, we don't know what's going on and how the supervisor is taking care of it. We brought it up to the right person. It's on them. Now, there's plenty more to say here, but that's enough for now. So Luther concludes the Eighth Commandment by connecting it with the golden rule. He says, The chief reason for this should be the one which Christ alleges in the gospel in which he comprehends all commandments respecting our neighbor. Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even unto them. Then he writes, Thus also among ourselves should we adorn whatever blemishes and and infirmities we find in our neighbor. Just put up with it. And serve and help him to promote his honor to the best of our ability. And on the other hand, prevent whatever may be discreditable to him. So once again, with these two commandments, as we've seen in the previous six, curses and blessings are set before us. Not exactly the same thing as law and gospel, but nonetheless, we clearly see what God forbids and blesses. What he promises to punish and to reward. And while his punishments might seem more obvious to us, and certainly they seem abstract and distant and delayed, his rewards seem even more. I get that. On the one hand. But on the other, let's remember the example of Ramsey Solutions. The no gossip policy contributes to the happiest workplace in Nashville, one of the happiest workplaces in all of Tennessee, which also puts it in the running for one of the happiest workplaces in the country. I mean, how would you like a no gossip policy with your own coworkers or your own family and friends? Be nice. And so like any good thing the Lord gives us to do, if you work it, it works. If you don't, you'll never know. It's not quite the same as the philosopher's leap of faith, a little bit different, a little bit different idea for another day. But really, who wants to argue with God whether or not God keeps his promises? Not me. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you have taught us what you would have us believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ to keep your word in pure hearts that thereby we may be strengthened in faith, perfected in holiness, and comforted in life and death. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen.